I'm proud of. To put my way through college, I became a stripper of wallpaper. And besides uh, being a stripper of wallpaper, well, that's how my painting career started. And one of the first jobs I had on my own, uh, I was 18 years old, I had to paint the little bungalow. And uh, I got there, I was all excited. And I'm painting around this bungalow, and I don't know the two neighbors are in dispute. So as soon as I crossed over a little bit on the property line, the neighbor called the cops, and she must have made a big deal because they didn't call one cop. Two cops came, uh, two police cars came with four cops, and they manhandled me, and they threw me off the property. And then all the neighbors came out, and when all of that settled, I didn't do anything wrong, but it really let me shook it up. So the next day I got to go to my next job on my very one on my own and I'm there and I'm driving there and all I have in my head is watch out for the neighbors. You can't trust the neighbors. Beware of the neighbors. And this is during the 80s and there's a, there's a couple of things that are very popular in the 80s. First thing is uh, Miami Vice. The second thing is the Rubik's Cube. And I'm proud to share that I was actually able to master the Rubik's Cube in less than 24 hours. I learned that if you're very careful, you can pull off the stickers and put them all in the right spot. <laughs> and there's something uh, about the 80s that was very popular was Miami Vice. And people would dress Miami Vice. Not only would they dress Miami Vice, but they would paint Miami Vice colors. Their houses were being painted these bright pinks, these fluorescent greens. And here I was going to this house, and I had to paint the whole exterior this Miami Vice fluorescent green. And so I, I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to have to cross over the property line again. So I said, you know what, I'll stick to the front, the front of the house. Maybe I can make friends with the neighbor. So I painted the fluorescent green garage door, the windows, the front door. I see the neighbor. I make friends with the neighbor. I had coffee with them in the afternoon. I, I drove home, I was all proud of myself. I said, you know what, wow. I'm friends with the neighbor, I handled this well. I got a good first coat on this house. Seven o'clock comes, lady phones me and she says, Fabio, I thought you were supposed to come and paint my house today. I said, what number is your house? 121. I painted 221. Oh. I painted the wrong house. <laughs> all I got in my head is, uh, I'll watch out for the neighbors. I thought, you know what, I painted the wrong house. And all night I'm thinking to myself, well, what do I do now? What do I say? What do I do? And I couldn't sleep that night. I'm thinking, do I knock on their door the next day and say, hey, I'm the guy who painted the wrong house? I said, do I knock on their door and say, hey, uh, do, you want me, do you want me to give it the second coat? And say, hey, do you want me to paint it back to the other color? And I, the more I thought about it, the more nervous I got, the more ashamed I got. So you know what I did? I did all the wrong things. I ran away. And for 25 years, I never told a living soul. I was so ashamed and so embarrassed, it was a secret I wasn't going to tell anybody. And one day, after 25 years, I got a little inner healing. And you know when you tend to tell the people that you trust and maybe somebody who's close to you? So I decided to tell this to my coworker, And he's a painter too, so he'll understand. And so I told him, and for the next three years, you know what I heard? Are you sure this is the right house? <laughs> Are you sure this is the right house? Are you sure this is the right house? And that's what I had to hear for the next three years. Until one day, he had his own shameful thing happen to him. See, one morning he wakes up and he's thinking it's date night tonight. So he takes a picture of his ding dong and puts it as a screensaver before his wife. And she goes to work and she's a receptionist. And somebody comes by and says, hey, can I borrow your phone? I've got to take a private call outside. Goes outside, she comes back, she goes, interesting screensaver. <laughs> At 12 o'clock, he phones her and he says, hey, how about that screensaver? She goes, screensaver. She looks down at her phone, she goes, oh my God. No wonder that's why half the office wanted to see my phone. <laughs> she goes, what are you going to do? It's, it's a Christmas party next week. He goes, I'm not going. There's no way he didn't want to do the walk of shame. There's no way he was going to do that walk of shame. But then it gets worse. She's on the bus. She loses her phone. And, uh, and, 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 yeah, and some good Samaritan brings it to 13th Division, gets a phone call, says, this is Officer So-and-so, we found a phone, you know who this might, whose phone this might be? And he goes, oh, that's my wife's phone. He goes, well, how do you know? He goes, well, it's got a picture of my ding-dong on the screensaver. And the couple says, oh, my gosh. He goes, well, come and pick it up. 
and they get in the car and they're fighting all the way there. Who's going to go inside? Who's going to go pick it up? Who's going to go inside? They're fighting. No, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. No, it's fault. your fault. And she finally, they finally get there and she says, you know what? Only because I love you, I'm going to go inside and pick up the phone. And he, she goes inside and she sees the, uh, she goes over to the officer and she says, uh, I'm here, you know, to pick up my phone, the one with the interesting screensaver. He goes, oh, you? Yeah. She goes to, he goes to the back and there's about 20 cops in the back, all get up to turn to rustle because they want to see who's going to come and pick up that phone. Who would do it? And they're all sticking their heads up to see, was there really somebody going to really come and pick this up? <laughs> and, uh, you know, all this didn't make too much sense to me until one day. I was coming home from work. It was a long day. I was tired. I was hungry. It was winter time. I put all my paint in the front passenger seat because it's winter time. I have to bring it inside or it's a little freeze. And as I'm driving home, I make a bad turn and this white paint falls all into the wheel well of the truck. So the good things then spill everywhere. It's spilled in this wheel well. And I'm thinking to myself, well, who wants to clean up this mess? I'm tired. I'm hungry. And then, and then I had a eureka moment. I'll let it freeze overnight and pick it up like an ice cube the next day. I was thinking, wow, great idea. So I go to my, my favorite sandwich shop. I order my sandwich. And I, I, I look through the window and I see this 12, 13 year old kid looking into my truck. And he's got these big Nike running shoes and they look brand new and I know exactly what he's looking at. He's looking at all that change just sitting right there. And then he does the unthinkable. He opens up the door and bam, all that paint falls on his shoes. And then he runs away. And then I run out there and you see these white footprints running away. <laughs> and instead of chasing him down, I know exactly where he goes. He runs to where all the kids are. And they're all getting on the bus. Now, have you ever heard the expression, you missed the bus? Well, the bus driver wouldn't let him on. And as I'm driving by, I can see he's doing what's called the walk of shame. See, the walk of shame is you got your head down and you're staring at your feet. And, and usually, when you're staring at your feet, you can't see your future. And sh that's what shame does. It makes you keep on staring uh, at your feet, at the things that you did, and never you can see your future. And I wanted to go by and I wanted to rub it in. I said, I'm going to rub it in. I was going to open up my window and say, nice footprints, buddy. And as I'm driving around about to do this, I look at my own shoes and I'm thinking, you know what? I've done some pretty shameful things myself. Things that I don't want to be reminded of. My footprints haven't always been the best. And then I remembered how my, my, uh, my friend's wife said that love covers up shame. That's what love does. And also, if you really love someone, you'll even be willing to do the walk of shame yourself so they don't have to. And you know, there are people in our lives right around us who are living in deep shame. They can be there for years. And shame paralyzes people. They're stuck. It's like being in a field of landmines and you can't move because every step is going to be a landmine. And that's what shame does. It makes you paralyzed. But what we can do is we have to create a, a place of trust. We can go over to those friends, walk next to them, create a place of trust so they can understand that it's okay. And all you need to say sometimes is it's going to be okay. And you, and you develop that trust, you say, you know what, walk with me, trust me, walk in my footprints, I'm going to lead you out. And you create safe foot footprints to let lead people out. And that's what shame is all about, you get rid of people's shame. But creating new footprints is not always easy. See, to create new footprints, you need to take off your old shoes. And you have to look at the soles of your shoes and it's filled with dirt. And that dirt is going to create the same bad footprint that you've been leaving behind. So to create new footprints is you've got to go look deep into the souls. Look deep and get rid of all that dirt from the past. Because the past dirt will affect your walk in your future. And to get rid of that, sometimes it's hard. It's not easy. Sometimes there's even in spots that turn into cement. And you've got to dig it out real deep. And into all the corners. And when you do that, then you can create new footprints. Thank you very much. Woo!